and welcome to another fantastic live stream from the Geo Institute. How do I know it will be fantastic? Well, so far, this is live stream maybe 104, and we are a perfect 100% so far in the greatness of our content. So that is how I know. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the Geo Institute, and we are thrilled to have you along with us as we start to look forward today to Geo Congress 2024. It will, of course, be in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and we're going to tell you a little bit more about it as we go through this stream this afternoon. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, I always wonder how people get here if they don't know anything about the Geo Institute. But just in case, after you watch this today, you should go over to geoinstitute.org and there you will find out that we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and that we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. If you like what you see today, and I always feel very strongly, dear viewer, that you will, you should click like, subscribe, and get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. So as I mentioned, this is a sneak preview, looking forward to Geo Congress 2024, and as such, moderating this excellent session today is one of our technical co-chairs, Katarina Ziatopoulou. Oh, fist pump, shout out Ross Boulanger from the University of California at Davis. And Katarina is now going to tell you who's going to speak to you today, but she's also going to tell you why you should not miss Geo Congress in Vancouver. Katarina, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Brad. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, like Brad said, I'm Katarina Ziodopoul. I'm an associate professor at UC Davis. But most importantly for you, I am the technical co-chair for the Geo Congress 2024 to be held in Vancouver uh, at the end of February 2024. Um, we have an exciting program ahead, lots of special sessions, award lectures, um, lots of local interests, social events. Um, so you have a great Geo Congress on steroids because it's going to be in Vancouver and it's going to be a great uh, location. As part of that, we're doing these uh, sneak previews um, with um, colleagues um, who have worked on, on, on very interesting case histories with um, interest on that location. And without further ado, today we have Gurpreet Pala of Qubit um, and James Williams of Basis Engineering, who will be presenting on the 2021 Highway 5 bridge collapses. Um, Gurpreet is a senior geotechnical engineer with Qubit Engineering Group in Canada, and he is based out of their Vancouver, British Columbia office. He has more than 15 years of experience working on various projects in lower mainland Vancouver. He specializes in infrastructure projects for highways, industrial, offshore, marine, and mine projects. His day-to-day -day work focuses on shallow and deep foundations, retaining walls, anchor systems, pile installation and testing, seismic design, and construction tasks and reviews. He was born and educated in India. He completed his bachelor's and master's degrees there, and he later completed his PhD from the University of Alberta in 2008. Gurpreet was Kiwi's geotechnical engineer of record, for the Highway 5 Emergency Repairs and Geotechnical Design Manager for the Permanent Reinstatement Work. Um, James Williams um, is a principal and the lead geotechnical engineer at Basis Engineering. He has more than 15 years experience in the analysis and design of bridge foundations, dams, tunnels, heavy industrial buildings, and transportation infrastructure. His field experience includes planning and supervision of site investigations, geotechnical instrumentation installation, and construction monitoring. James also has experience in slope stability, settlement analysis, seismic analysis, local faction assessments, tunnel design, shallow foundation design, and pile design. He has worked in Canada and in the UK, and James has recently been the geotechnical engineer of record on several major transportation projects in British Columbia, including the Kicking Horse Canyon Phase 4 project and the Highway 5 permanent reinstatement work. So without further ado, I'm going to yield the floor to them. And I hope you will enjoy their presentation. You can post questions um, on the chat and YouTube, and I'll make sure to um, to um, share them after uh, Gurpreet and James are done. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Katrina. I'll share my screen here. 
Uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Katrina, there. We will be presenting the case history of Highway 5 emergency response and re reinstatement. As the title says, it's in two parts, so we'll be actually presenting in two sessions as well. I'll be talking more on the emergency response, and James will be talking more on the reinstatement of the permanent bridges. <coughs> So how we have divided this uh, discussion uh, of the case history is we will pre present the event, the damages, and then how we did the emergency response, who were all the parties actually involved in completing the emergency response. And then we will transition into the construction of the permanent bridges, in particular at the three locations, which we are naming here as Bottle Top, Juliet, and Jessica. We'll show where these locations are afterwards. But before I actually go into the presentation mode, I will like to take an opportunity to actually thank uh, British Columbia Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure for providing us an opportunity to actually work on this project and giving us an approval to actually present this case history to the, the entire geotechnical community. And thanks again to ASE Geo Institute as well for giving us an opportunity to actually present uh, for the Geo Congress kickstart the session as well. So in terms of the event and the damage, I think it was quite significant. And then let's start our discussion with the event, which actually resulted in all of uh, this catastrophe in the lower mainland British Columbia here. During the months of uh, November 2021 and moving into December, say 2021, this word atmospheric river was actually coming quite a bit into the discussions or into the news on a routine or regular basis. I think uh, this is the word which I had heard for the first time myself, the term atmospheric river. Then I was sitting and kind of thinking, oh, what actually we mean by this word of atmospheric river? If I say I have a rainfall event, which is say about 250, 300 millimeters or 12 inches of rain spread out in a month period of time, you know, like I think in general, we will be fine. But when I say that this whole 11 inches of rain is going to get dumped in a single day over the entire lower mainland or into our mountains, then this becomes a significant amount of just discharge or a downpour, which will actually result in flooding and other events. So what happened on November 14th to 15th is there was a big event called the Atmospheric River where we had about 280 millimeters of rain or 11 inches of actually rainfall event in a single day. Apart from this single event during the whole month of November, we had been having some smaller to a larger Atmospheric River events, which actually ended up in accumulating to about 615 millimeters of rain in the single month of November, which, which kind of co correlates to about 25 inches of rainfall event in a single month. Apart from that, we had early snowfall in the month of November as well in our upper mountains. And then when these atmospheric river rainfall events came in, what happened is the snow melt came and this added to the more discharge into our rivers. So in a nutshell, if, if you we look at actually our plot on um, the side here, you can see, you know, like it's all red where our Vancouver is. Uh, Seattle is somewhere about here. And then you can see this whole area of Vancouver and its surrounding neighborhoods were all dumped with significant amount of rain. Even I think the charts, uh, I think it doesn't go more than 100 millimeters or four inches, but you can actually see we got dumped with about 200 or 28 centimeters of rain in a single day. So in in nutshell, damages were about 2.5 to 75 billion dollars, quite significant. So if we start looking at the damage, it, it was a big gruesome picture all around. So if we stay, the Vancouver is here, this is US Canada border right here all along. This whole area is actually known as the lower mainland Vancouver. And then as we head along this Fraser River, which is a main river in our lower mainland here, this whole area is known as the Fraser Valley. So area of the lower mainland and Fraser Valley is uh, kind of surrounded by mountain, mount, uh, Rocky Mountains all around. And the only access we have with the rest of Canada is going on Highway 1, which goes all the way to Hope. Hope is about 150 kilometers east from Vancouver. So this highway actually bifurcates into three different highways. Highway 1 continues up here and then goes into Kamloops and then go into towards Toronto all the way. And then we do have this Highway 3, 
which goes through quite steep mountain trains you know like i think the and in in winter driving is kind of a bit of a challenge uh, moving along this highway in 1980s uh, this uh, kokahala highway highway 5 was created all along in this section which kind of gave a nice path for the people to actually go from hope into merit into kamloops at a faster pace so this is the zone where i will be actually focusing my attention because this is highway 5 this all purple zone this is also known as the kokahala highway because it goes over kokahala summit which is a quite high train up here and then this four lane road actually takes us down all the way into the valley into the kamloops so you can actually see all around starting from um, towards pemberton whistler whistler is actually a nice skiing community we have about here and so this is all into the mountains as well before you go down towards the valley into the lilwet you can see the damages in this area some damages all along highway 1 which are ported about here and then quite a few damages in the fraser valley as well you know like you can see significant flooding and damages happening this is a, this is a, in abbotsford you can see the entire community the farms everything was actually flooded right here and we'll be talking of this zone more number 11 12 13 where we had quite a few damages actually happening in 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 our infrastructure on the highway so let's talk of the flooding event what happened actually you know like if if we see hope was here which is about 150 kilometers i said and then the highway 5 actually moves along in this section this highway 5 goes around with this kokahala river so uh, you can see you know like i think this river is being fed by the swakaw creek the duni creek two of our bridges are actually which collapse uh, one is about here the jessica bridge and the uh, the caroline bridge is about here we'll be talking of these two bridges uh, um, in the coming slides but if we want to see how the discharge was actually recorded in the kokahala river so this is kind of just a summary plot which we have taken it from the bc website where the data in terms of the water levels and the discharge in the river is kind of accounted for so this presents the water level which is a kind of shown in green and compares to the discharge in the river which is shown in this orange color over the entire year of 2021 so if we see in 2021 starting in january you can actually see this is typical british columbia we get our rainfalls some some nice dry days and then you know, like we we keep transitioning in, through our rainfall into the summer this is where the big freshet happens you know like all the snowfall in the mountains they melt and start adding to the water uh, in our rivers and moving into the nice summer you know like everything tends to dry off and then we go back into our rainy period starting in october november and then before we go back again into our january february right here so what happened in november is all about here you can actually see quite a few events were already kind of happening but this is that big event on the november 14th and 15th where you can actually see a big big spike here this is where that whole 230 centimeters or millimeters of rain actually even happened so if we start looking at the water heads you know like i think it went up by about 3 meters and then in terms of the discharge in a single day you know like i think the maximum discharge recorded was about 662 cubic meters per second so this is quite significant in terms of the velocity and the force it will generate and the amount of erosion and you know like other damages it can actually create so let's uh, see you know like for the emergency response what was the scope and uh, how we executed the, the, the project let's keep an eye on this uh, debris pile or the log piles which actually jammed this was actually on on a kind of a good or a benefit note for us in some ways so the emergency response team talking about the emergency response team it was done in collaboration with kivit and amal anderson Amal Anderson is actually um, BCMOT's maintenance contractor for this Highway 5 section of Kokahala Highway, and then Kivit was involved as a subcontractor to Amal Anderson to complete this emergency response. Now the question is why Kivit? Kivit was actually working in this area on the Trans Mountain Pipeline all along the Highway 5 section. 
so as the pipeline was being constructed we were kind of you know like our equipment our people our setup and staff was all distributed along the highway at different locations so that that's why you like we were able to fully mobilize our construction and engineering teams in a matter of days and the main concern is our equipment was actually stuck at different locations so but now if you see that i have to go and do in my repairs i cannot actually have a path in to go that do the repairs but give it was actually ha- it's there the equipment was stuck in between these uh, kind of fallen bridges so we were there so we were able to actually mobilize fast and complete the emergency response so in terms of the task once it was okay you know like in couple of days they say okay let's give it go ahead let, let's complete the work so the task was let's open two lanes of the Co- kokahara highway right now it was actually four lane traffic but the point was let's open at least two lanes of the traffic and get it done by january 2022 why the rush was there because as i was pointing out the lower mainland had only limited connection to the rest of the canada so bringing the supplies the food and everything else into the lower mainland was going to become a big bottleneck it was going to it was becoming a concern the food was not coming in so it was challenging going through highway 3 so sometimes i think the trucks were coming into the states through washington and then coming back from seattle and up into vancouver so it was very important for us to open open kokahala highway at least two lanes so that these basic necessities these can be all spread into the lower mainland so in terms of the scope uh, you know like all along this highway 5 so you can actually see from hope all the way as we go up north on highway 5 into the mountains as we go up on the summit we had four bridges which we were to fix the the bridge the, these are actually at a lower elevations and then we climb up so the first bridge in challenge was the jessica bridge then the caroline bridge and then moving up uh, we had the juliet and the bottle top bridge and there were other couple of bridges the brody bridge and the king wheels bridge which was also showing some signs of distress or undermining at their abutments so those were also repaired i will talk about them quickly later on but a- apart from these bridges um, there was quite a significant section of the road at othello which was washed out and then we had quite a few debris flows which were to be cleaned the smaller roads were all taken out the culverts were all plugged they need to be cleaned out so the tasks were actually quite a few apart from just the construction of the bridges itself so those all started right away i think the bridges the construction started a little bit later into the run now the challenge is you know like how fast actually we can mobilize the team so that you know like we can attain this task which is given to us open two lanes but in a shorter time of time shorter frame of time so i think that was more important and apart from fast mobilization it was more important was there were no project specification like you know what needs to be done we don't know because the uh, options have not been selected what is the scope of the work you know like it was still under development and if we don't know what needs to be done there were no supplier contracts yet in place so i think it was a big big task how bcmlt i feel was able to actually negotiate this was by actually completing some as and when contracts with multiple parties and were able to actually support this emergency response respared so i think that was a very good job done over there for that so in general when we talk of a project i think our flow path is very strange similar like you know straight you start with the pre design then you get into the engineering mode you procure construct and then you start right so it's it's all that simple process but then once you get into this mode of emergency repairs you know like just as a notion like you know everything was actually happening hand in hand we have not even done the complete design when the construction was actually taking place so you know like we cannot wait for the design to be done and then the construction to start we came up with an idea that is to be done okay let's start the construction and then let's go with it so the the first step moving into this path is okay let's go out and see what the challenge is there now since uh, the bridges are all down the highways that no connectivity is there how do we go there there is only one way to go okay helicopters let's go let's go out there 
So we need to understand what repairs are needed where we need to do map them. So we started mapping them or kind of putting our thumb tags on Google Earth, figuring out where those locations were, what needs to be done at what location. So, you know, like this was coming up in our daily discussions. OK, this needs to be done here. This needs to be done here. Culvert needs to be opened here. This is debris flow, road missing here. So I think all of those tasks were identified on daily basis with our construction team. In particular, let's talk about the four bridges which were of more interest for everybody. And then we said, oh, you know, like okay, these are the four bridges which are going to present us challenge how we want to open them these up in, in a shorter amount of time. So starting with the Jessica Bridge, uh, you know, like which was close to hope, uh, you know, like you can actually see the, there was erosion under the shallow footing which was supporting the abutment right here. So the the water flow is in this direction. And then you can actually see this was sitting on the outside bend of the river. So you know, like it eroded or undermined the the spread footing from the abutments. So this collapsed. Kind of I was highlighting to this fact of the debris, you know, like actually this prevented the flowing direction into the other in back into the river. And then you know, like I think this damage was kind of prevented or slowed down a bit. So moving on to the Caroline Bridge, same logic. The water is flowing in this direction. You, we are again sitting actually on the outside uh, bend of the river. The river tends to flow here. You can actually see a lot of debris fan, which has accumulated here. And then you know, like I think the water flowing here, it, it took out all the backfill. Like you know, this this was actually sitting on piles. This was not on spread footing. That's why the bridge didn't collapse. Uh, you know, like this is actually a spread footing here as well, but then this is on, not on the outside bridge. The water never reached there. This is a small access road here, so no concern. So it was on piles, piles, it, it, uh, everything is fine. And then we had to go in and actually backfill this zone. I'll talk about it in a bit. N number three bridge, the, as we go up on Highway 5, was the Juliet Bridge. You know, like actually the, typically the river flows actually right here. But then you can actually see quite a bit of a deposition in terms of the debris fan right in the middle of the piers right here. And you can actually see quite a significant discover here in on the piles as well. So that means you, the river has eroded quite a bit and this, this was exposed to about three, three and a half meters. There is a small access road which actually used to sit right here. And then this has all undermined uh, and uh, the embankment was all gone. So this abutment is on spread footing. You can actually see a small exposed spread footings uh, about there. But th actually I'll uh, give kudos to the construction team in the 1980s to a very well compaction job done in, in the embankment. You can actually see when we were out there, this was standing at 90 degrees or near vertical, you know, like I think then we say, oh, wow, you know, like what a job done in terms of the compaction of these embankments. The fourth bridge we ran into was the bottle top bridge. And uh, the same thing happened, you know, like a lot of debris uh, kind of accumulated or in the bar here, you know, like the river you actually used to flow right here. And then uh, it kind of, you know, like changed its course, created an outer bend where significant erosion happened then moved up here and then uh, again an outer bend here where actually most of the energy is uh, uh, imparted and then uh, undermining at the abutment as well. So the abutments here were gone. This abutment was partially hanging here and then these abutments were all gone because these were all spread footings. So spread footings, spread footings were a not good idea, but it, it was okay. I think in the 1980s, the spread footings was a common way of designing the bridges, but not nowadays where for any bridges uh, sitting on the rivers, we cannot put our bridge structure actually on spread footings. They all need to be on deep foundations. So as I was highlighting to the fact of the debris here, you can actually see a, quite a bit of a log jam here as well as here. So most likely this helped prevent more loss to the structure here, which we kind of took advantage of during our emergency repairs. So in nutshell, you know, like what did we learn from these inspections was that the main cause was because the abutments, they were all forded on spread footings that got undermined. That's why this became a concern. If uh, these were on piles, only embankment would have gone. We could have just gone in, placed some material, the highway would have been opened right away. When in particular, the rivers, they carved a new path and in particular uh, around the outside bend at these locations. So I think these were the two main lessons learned in terms of you know, like what went wrong out there.
So how did we go in and did our emergency repairs? Uh, let's talk about these emergency repairs, but I'll talk about them in a uh, kind of a bridge by bridge. I'll uh, keep it can kind of talk about through some sketches as well as photographs. So let's start with the simplest bridge, the Caroline Bridge, which was actually sitting on a pile foundation. You can actually see pile foundation and a pile foundation here. So this was all non piles, the outside bend which got undermined. So quite a bit of a debris fan here. So our first goal was let's get rid of this fan, put the river back here. So we retrained the river to flow back in here. So you can actually see we are down there kind of retraining the river. No more water actually at higher levels. And then apart from that, we were able to actually use this as a backfill. You can actually see the backfill here. So the intent was use this 300 mm minus backfill, go back, start compacting it in with eight, 10 or 10 ton smooth drum rollers. So as we're completing uh, the compactions, we thought of adding some uniaxial geogrids in it to strengthen the approach uh, kind of uh, backfill zone. It's, uh, so just an idea, not from stability or any other point of view, we just wanted to give a little bit of better performance to the backfill we were placing. And then moving on to the, we, as I was discussing earlier, there was an excess road which was here. So we thought, okay, let's retrain the river, put it back in between the piers. So once that's done, you know, like we just went in, reconstructed the embankment and established the excess road right there. So this was a thought process at the Juliet Bridge. And as I was highlighting to the facts of the Brody Bridge and uh, you know, like I think same happened at the Brody Bridge as well. A very similar erosion over there. We went in and then kind of fixed the kind of recreated the uh, approach uh, embankment there. At the bottle top, it was quite a bit of work which needs to be done. So this is how actually we were working on our design on daily basis. Just a chicken scratch here for reference. So this is how our general arrangement ranks were created on a drone footage. And this was our way of communications between all of our parties. This was a single source of truth on daily basis for us. This will get emailed, sent around into the team. Okay, this is for the, the plan we have for today. And then I think more important is we need to have a good trust between the design and the construction teams that what is being presented is a workable solution and a constructible solution. And then it's it's a fast construction as well. So at bottle top, we came up with an option of MSC wall. So the thought was this was that abutment which was needs to but fix. We that was easy. But then the thought we apart from all the other structural options we came up with, we figured out that constructing an MSC wall will be way easier than bringing all the equipment need, needed to do all the structural work. So the abutment was here. We, uh, you know, like the intent was go, let's build this MSC wall. And then we will have a small jump span here, which was about three meters. And then we should be good to go. At bottle top, the geology was very good. The soils were like dense sand and gravel up on the top, couple of meters, followed by kind of compact to dense sands. So in terms of the performance or the slippability the, of these MSC walls, it was not presenting us a concern. Why we are concerned about the settlements? Because like if I have settlements here, I can actually establish some down drags in the piles. So we kind of still checked with the settlements, associated down drags, evaluated the piles, everything made sense. And then in addition to do, just doing our basic simple calculations for MSC walls, global stability, down drag calculations, we ended up actually setting up a plexus model just to understand the stress deformation characteristics of, uh, of on or impact actually on the pile as well. So structural evaluations were created, uh, kind of completed on the project uh, as well. You know, like once these are, they said the structural integrity here, give it a support. Build MSC wall, uh, jump span, and we should be good to go. So, in terms of uh, construction progression, just on some pictures, you can actually see this is the damage which was out there. So, we came in, retrained the river. So, we took off these fallen uh, kind of deck panels. They were all taken out. We established a boom here and then went in and placed about 10 MPA concrete to give a support to this exposed abutment. And then went in, constructed the MSC wall 
put a jump span as it was doing. You know, we re-established the river bank, placed riprap all along here. We re-established the highway embankment, but at a lower level, it didn't went all the way till it was supposed to, and then uh, we placed riprap all along for to prevent further erosion of uh, the completed project. So, a couple of uh, snapshot pictures just to show how it all looked like. You can actually see the abutment has been stabilized. The process of MSC wall construction and preparing the base for the MSC wall is ongoing. The riprap has been placed. The river has been retrained. And then we do have this bridge to nowhere sitting in the middle, you know, like which stayed with us for quite a few months before it was taken down. The only drawback we had here was we had to actually go in and create a concrete uh, base for putting our jump span in. So this is the framework which was actually going in to create the kind of a leg for placing the jump span. So how did the completed MSC wall look? You know, like, this is nine months after the construction. You can actually see about six meter high MSC wall fill constructed using wire mesh. These are all temporary wire mesh baskets and then with the geogrid. Uh, so worked very well, riprap over there. But this is how actually it looked like during construction in winter when we were working in very cold minus 20, minus 30 environments and in snow all the day. So this is how it looked like during the during the construction. And moving on to the fourth bridge, the Jessica, uh, we came up with the same plan. The, the native soils were dense to very dense sand and gravel. So no concerns in terms of adopting the same solution of putting an MSC wall here, but this MSC wall was actually way higher than what we were thinking at uh, the bottle top. Bottle top was about six meters high. This was 7.2, and then if we go from the base, it ended up being about 10 meter high MSC wall st structures on an embankment. But here we were not able to actually source uh, wire from baskets. So, but we were able to actually source lock blocks. So we ended up actually using lock blocks for the construction of the MSC wall face and the geogrids all, they all ran. And we had a kind of a turn here. We had to do a little bit of an interesting fix here so that we do not lose our material uh, at this location. You can actually see the jump span has been placed. The ash wall is in and we are waiting for the second jump span to go in at Jessica. The riprap, big riprap pieces were placed here. Interesting enough, uh, as I was showing you on the hydrograph, there was a big rainfall event. And, and as we were actually working and trying to set up uh, the bases for the construction, we had another atmospheric river uh, event. So what we had actually accomplished in five, six days, it was eroded back again. And then we had to go back in again and start the reconstruction you know, from step one. So this is how the temporary MSC wall looked like right from the river level. Uh, we are actually putting in a temporary bridge right here, but I think you can actually see how it looked like with all the riprap quite stable. Uh, it's from the top, from the drone, two jump spans, three meters long. Uh, and you know, like I think on both sides, uh, this is these are just the piles going in for the temporary bridge. And then the more important question everybody is going to ask is how did they actually perform? Um, you know, like because we were just placing this jump span on the compacted gravel and on the messy wall. This is a picture uh, nine months uh, uh, into the construction. You can actually see there was no separation, no settlements, no cracking, nothing happened. And these actually stayed for more than a year and a half. We just demolished these in June, July this year. And they kept on performing to the same level what you actually see here. No cracking, no settlements, no loss of materials. They performed very well. So I think this option, what we figured out will work, kind of work to our expectations. And then we had designed it for a kind of a three year window, but I think uh, these are all gone now, everything what has been there. And then this is how I just want to kind of sell my beautiful British Columbia here. It's so beautiful out there. This is a Jessica bridge, the same bridge here, how it looks like into the valley. In a nutshell, I think the beauty and the beast uh, together in one picture. And then if we move on towards the results, what did we get? I think looking at the bottle top picture, you can actually see we were able to open to the traffic early. We were able to open six weeks early. We The highway, the two lanes of the highway were actually open on 20th December, much to the delight of the people going home for Christmas that year. And with less than about five weeks of total work done, 
this kind of led uh, BC Minister of Transportation Rob Fleming to give a remark that one of the most remarkable engineering feats in the recent history of uh, engineering for British Columbia. And then in terms of the effort, you can actually see a, just a summary of how many construction of uh, heavy equipment and then you know, like subcontractors were actually involved. 36 design engineer stuff. The packages were like about 24, 60 drawings, you can say. And we worked continuously long hours for 35 days before we opened up the two lanes of the traffic. And let's move into the reinstatement before I actually give off this to James. I'd like to talk about uh, the design model we have for this. This is more of a collaborative model or alternate delivery model for a project for the design build. This is being called an alliance model. More importantly, what was the need for this? Because there was a kind of a significant schedule advantage because the deadlines were so close that we had to actually open the four lanes permanent bridges installed by end of 2023. So that's why it became very important in terms of the schedule that we needed some sort of a model where the owner and the contractors, they can sit together, come up with the design and then finish the work. So in terms of the lines model, it's good from the contractor point of view as well. It's no claim, low loss, good for the owners as well, or we sometimes call it the pain share gain share model. So we ended up actually naming this as the Coca-Cola Alliance team, the CAT5 team, which comprised of Ministry of Transportation, Kivit, uh, engineers, geotechnical and structural both, ML and construction team, and bases, uh, structural and geotechnical uh, group uh, both. We were all actually involved in daily task force meeting where the decisions were able to easily kind of get, go through and vetted by the BCMOT, whether we are heading in the right direction in terms of uh, the design and our assumptions. I think it was a good pace uh, alliance model for, for this type of uh, delivery project. I'll actually hand over the screen to James to talk about uh, the permanent or the reinstatement work. Great, uh, thanks Kapreet, and uh, thanks to the uh, GEO Congress Organizing Committee for giving me the chance to talk on this uh, reinstatement work. Um, the Highway 5 reinstatement work was a, a big scope of work. Uh, it included the um, reinstatement and replacement of three bridges on the Coquihalla, uh, Jessica Bridge, Juliet Bridge, and Bottle Top Bridge. Um, but as each of these were twi twin bridges, the actual scope included six permanent bridges and uh, two temporary bridges. Um, you know, in a short presentation, it's going to be hard to talk about uh, the whole job we did. Um, so I wanted to focus on just Jessica Bridge and Juliet Bridge and just certain aspects of the geotechnical design. Uh, so Jessica Bridge uh, kicked off in uh, May 2022 for the reinstatement. Um, at the end of the emergency works, there were four lanes of traffic open here. So the requirements of the, the design and construction was to um, reinstate the bridges while keeping the four lanes of traffic open. Right at the start, we had uh, you know no hydrotechnical assessment. Uh, we didn't know what the span arrangement looked like, and we only had a rough sense of the geotechnical conditions. But we did know that we had to uh, order steel pipe piles right away, get the geotechnical investigation done immediately, and uh, get these piles installed so that we can move forward with construction of the superstructure. Um, the geotechnical design was going on the entire time, but in parallel, there was a hydrotechnical and structural design going on by the team. Um, we, we knew that the the bridge had to be longer to increase the the channel widths, and the uh, the hydrotechnical design was uh, was increasing the channel width and bringing the river channel back to the um, you know pre-construction condition in the 70s. Um, the hydrotechnical design also involved modeling of the flood events and the scour depths uh, towards the design. So once the channel was figured out, uh, the structural span arrangement was uh, established. Uh, it became a 36 and a half by 58 by 36 and a half meter span arrangement. Uh, the large 58 meter span uh, sort of drove the design towards a uh, steel girder construction. Um, based on this layout, uh, the foundations uh, looked to be four 914 diameter piles uh, at each pier and abutment. Uh, so it got kicked off in May and we were out in the field doing uh, field investigations in June uh, the following month. Uh, we had to basically mobilize whatever equipment was available in the province um, at short notice and we managed to end up with an instrumented uh, Becker penetration rig as well as a conventional ODEX rig. 
Um, the purpose was to expand that the bridge was getting longer, so we needed to take a look at the abutments and we need to just establish more modern investigation. Uh, the black uh, uh, boreholes here were historic and the uh, red and blue are the, the new locations. Uh, on this bank, uh, it looks like it was peppered with boreholes, but these are uh, refused boreholes that uh, were fused in the uh, coarse grained alluvium material, which was uh, sort of an important consideration. Here's a cross section of the Jessica Bridge. Uh, what we found was there was uh, fairly dense alluvium of 20 meters thickness that consisted of sand, gravels, cobbles, and boulders. Um, till was found to be very, very dense sands and gravels with a bit of a clay matrix. Um, this is the, uh, you know, a little bit of the sample of the till out of a large diameter split spoon. Um, and, and the big consideration was, was the cobbles, you know, we refused in a bunch of uh, the shallow uh, boreholes, so we knew that we would have to uh, drill these uh, piles in for the, the design of the bridge. So that led us to the, the geotechnical design. Um, we decided to go with uh, end bearing piles with the tip of the pile being in that glacial till layer. Uh, we knew we needed to get through those boulders and cobbles, so to improve our chances, we mobilized a bunch of equipment to site. Uh, we had a conventional drilled system with uh, with an auger, as well as a downhole hammer system, as well as we mobilized a downhole ring bit system uh, to get through the, the tough soils. Uh, as on the left here, you can see the uh, the conventional um, drill and auger method, and then on the right is the uh, the ring bit system. Uh, as these are end bearing piles, we uh, installed a concrete plug uh, and this was done by uh, Tremi Concrete. Uh, to establish the end bearing resistance, we know we had to um, have some sort of end bearing displacement. Uh, so once the concrete plugs were cured, we um, advanced these piles with the D138 diesel hammer. We came up with the termination criteria using the wave equation analysis or WEEP. Uh, we we're searching for ultimate resistances of 7 meganewtons at the abutments and about 11 meganewtons at the piers. Uh, what we found is that these piles actually drove some distance into the glacial till between 1 and 2 meters until the termination criteria was achieved. Uh, the deeper piles at the piers uh, typically started to have an increased resistance all of a sudden and we go to a practical refusal versus the lower termination criteria. Here's a photo of the uh, Jessica temporary bridge. Um, I just wanted to show this photo here because uh, you can see the uh, the existing bridge on, on either side, and it just shows how how tight the construction space was while we were trying to get that temp bridge in place. Um, also, like to show that you know this is our working area uh, for the the southbound bridge, and so in order to create that space, we needed to build these approaches uh, with you know temporary MSC basket walls in order to establish that space. Um, we also got started uh, with early demolition of the uh, the existing bridge to to try to push push schedule forward. Uh, here's a couple photos of the pile installation. Um, first of all, you can see that uh, MSC basket wall in the north abutment, which was required to you know, create these pads. Um, you know, we had to excavate down to underside of the the pier caps. Um, and then that's why the wall is that size. Uh, on this side, this is our conventional uh, drilling and, and auger rig. On the south abutment, uh, much the same. Uh, this is our ring bit um, down the whole system, and we needed that M MSC wall to, to create the space. The other thing I'd note from this is just how, how tight uh, the piles were going into the, uh, the previous uh, pier cap and, and bridge. Some photos of the actual uh, superstructure construction uh, in April 2023 here, the, the girders were going in on the southbound bridge. And by June 2023, uh, the deck was poured and, and the highway was open. Um, on this picture, I'd just like to point out sort of the jigsaw puzzle that was this uh, temporary approach to the temporary bridge. Uh, we had to excavate on, uh, you know, on the northbound side uh, to create that same MSE wall to create the space to, to get in and install the piles. So these approaches ended up being uh, these double sided MSC wall structures. A couple photos of the northbound bridge construction. Uh, here's a photo in June 2023, uh, just showing that that MSC wall on the other side um, and, and the piles going in with the conventional um, drilled piles. 
And here's a recent photo from just last week of the uh, the bridge in its current configuration. The, the bridges are virtually complete and the uh, asphalt is being um, constructed on the approaches. Uh, switching gears over to Juliet Bridge. Um, like Jessica, the project got kicked off in, in May 2022. Um, unlike uh, Jessica, there was only two lanes in operation after the emergency repairs. Uh, so the goal became to establish the, the four lanes before uh, Christmas. Um, as before, we didn't have a sense of the hydrotechnical uh, design or the span arrangement or the geotechnical conditions when we got started. Uh, but we know we had to order pipe right away for the piling, do the investigations and, um, you know, design and install the permanent piles. Uh, the difference here between uh, Juliet and Jessica was that at Juliet, there was a, quite a distance between the two original bridges. And that allowed for the construction of a permanent bridge in between the two, um, like a full width permanent bridge in between the two existing roads. So this led for the, um, you know, the four lanes before Christmas to include a permanent uh, bridge. So to construct the bridge and design and construct the bridge in six months, uh, we the design led us to a precast, a concrete box girder option. We could do this because there were fabricators in BC that could fabricate these box girders in that uh, short amount of time. Uh, that led us to a, a span configuration of 26 meters by 30.5 meters by 26 by 26. Um, based on this loading, we ended up with uh, a, a four piles at each pier and abutment, uh, 914 diameter by uh, 19 mil thickness. Uh, kicked off in May, we were doing site investigations in June. At this location, we were doing the instrumented uh, Becker penetration tests and the mud rotary tests. Um, as the bridge was getting longer, we had to get some additional information at the uh, the new abutment locations, as well as get some information for the piers at the along the new alignment. Here's a cross section at Juliet. This is uh, much different than the conditions at uh, Jessica. Um, there was a layer of uh, coarse grained alluvial deposits at the surface, um, which were fairly dense. Underlying this, though, was a uh, fine grained glacial lacustrian deposit. Uh, you can see that uh, split spoon here with the lacustrian deposit there. Uh, this deposit consisted of low plastic uh, silt. In fact, it was 90% silt, uh, very little clay or sand in it. Um, we, uh, we knew that right off the bat that these were going to be problematic for um, uh, for pile design. Uh, we had another problem. The uh, the equipment we mobilized to site um, sort of struggled to get past this depth. The, the Becker penetration tests um, maxed out on, on side friction and uh, the mud rotary equipment that was available was only capable of getting to a certain depth. So we proved just about the bottom of the glacial lacustrian material, but we couldn't get uh, much much deeper than that. Um, we did have some historic seismic line information from close by that that indicated that there was a very dense uh, glacial till layer about 15 meters below the, the bottom of our, our deepest borehole. Um, when we encountered the, uh, you know, these, these silts, we realized that, uh, you know, Pecker penetration test probably wasn't the best way to go. Uh, but due to the, you know, the construction schedule, it was going to be difficult to uh, mobilize a uh, like a CPT rig in this in this time frame. Uh, here's a summary of the uh, penetration results. Uh, the, the gray data on these plots are equivalent N60 blow counts from the Becker penetration test. Uh, the orange and blue are the, the actual SPT tests for mud rotary holes. Um, they, they match quite well in the, uh, in the dense uh, alluvium, um, and that had a sort of blow counts from 40 to 80. In the glacial lacustrian material, uh, we found that the BPTs uh, seem to underestimate the uh, the N60 values, and that was due to uh, you know poor pressure increase and disturbance uh, due to the, the 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 Becker, which is basically a mini miniature pile. Um, the discrepancy between the you know the SPTs and the equivalent Becker led us to believe that you know when we're pile driving, there's going to be that same disturbance, and uh, there'll likely be some some setup effects uh, resulting over time. Um, after pile installation. 
so the pile design led us to design open-ended uh, friction pipe piles. Um, we pre-drilled through some of the, um, the riprap and, and dense granular deposits. Uh, the scour depth was quite significant, so we weren't worried about uh, obtaining axial uh, resistance uh, near the surface. Um, drove the piles with this uh, hydraulic uh, Jintan hammer and came up with a termination criteria based on the wave equation analysis. We were targeting an ultimate resistance uh, of six meganewtons at the abutments and nine meganewtons at the piers. Uh, we specified that we do one uh, PDA test at each pier and abutment uh, so that we could potentially use a higher resistance factor um, and also verify the, um, the resistances that we were achieving. Uh, the pile driving was a bit uh, bit challenging. Here's here's the typical uh, pile driving plot for the piers at Juliet. Um, the uh, orange data here is the the penetration rates or blows per uh, 250 millimeters, and uh, this blue plot is the the hammer energy. What we found is once we got into the glacial lacustrian soils and we were running at a full hammer energy, we weren't getting a pickup of the um, um, the blow counts or, or resistances, and this confirmed our, our thoughts that there was going to be some, some setup effect. Uh, we stopped at the design tip elevation um, on several of these piles, and then we waited to do a restrike uh, between three and five days. And, uh, you know, as expected, we, we found a pickup in the uh, in the blow counts, um, but our, our uh, required termination criteria was around 55, 53 blows per 250, and we still, even after that pickup, we weren't getting it. Um, so we, we had some discussions with the project team and uh, project decision was ultimately made to try to get down to that dense glacial till so that we could, um, you know, rely on that resistance right away. Uh, schedule was important, so we wanted to be able to build uh, pier caps and superstructure immediately following uh, pile driving. Uh, so what did that look like? Uh, the blue line here is our, our design elevation of these piles. Uh, the gray uh, our actual uh, pile installation. Um, the piers all went to till. At the abutments, we managed to build up the resistance just with friction. Uh, the decision to drive the piles deeper led to increased pile lengths and installation costs. However, the certainty it added uh, to the schedule in terms of guaranteeing resistance at the end of the initial drive uh, allowed for the bridge to be constructed and opened within the, the tight schedule of uh, six months. Um, here's a photo of the progress uh, October last year. Uh, the, the northbound bridge is piles are installed and, and uh, pier caps are, are in place. Uh, you can see that we got a few piles done on the southbound bridge as well. Um, so we thought we had an opportunity here to do a little bit of testing to actually see what these um, setup effects were over the longer term because we didn't have to build superstructure until the following year on this bridge. Um, here's the results of that uh, that setup tests. Uh, this is the on the left axis the the pile capacity ratio, bottom axis time. Um, these are the initial uh, three to five day tests uh, that show you know between a 10% and 30% increase in resistance from the uh, initial initial drive. Um, you know due to the scheduling of the rig and the other bridges we were working on, uh, we were only able to get the um, the pile driving rig back 142 days later, but at that point there was a you know a significant increase, about 75% from the uh, um, initial drive. Uh, unfortunately, we we didn't have more resolution in this uh, intermediate period to see how quickly this uh, you know this increase happened. Um, so we weren't sure if we could rely on that increase in the in the project schedule we had. So again, for the the southbound bridge, and a decision was made that we would just get these piles to till so that we could build superstructure and, and advance the schedule. Uh, just finished with a couple photos here. Uh, here's Juliet Northbound Bridge in uh, in October with the uh, the box stringers going in. Uh, these box stringers are nice because uh, once you, the, you know, the contractor does a few and gets in the rhythm, they go in really, really quickly and easily. Um, here's December 2022, just for Christmas when it's open. Uh, concrete decks in place, uh, it's open to traffic. In March 2023, uh, the um, piles going in on the southbound bridge, um, pile caps and, uh, and abutments being done in May. Uh, box stringers being installed in May 2023 again. And then here's a recent photo of the, um, the, 
the state and, and just recently in October. Highways fully open, four lanes. Uh, some ongoing work's being done on the revetment and uh, and the riprap design. Um, with that, that's the end of my presentation. I think we can move over to some questions. Thank you, James, and thank you, Gulfried. Very nice presentation, very thoughtful explanations, and very helpful cartoons. So um, thanks a lot. Um, before we get to some of the questions of our audience, I, I have two questions, like very broad. So um, what is the standard design for, for bridges um, in, in that area? Is that I, I bet it wasn't like the 660 cubic meters per second or... The elevation that comes with that, but is that the steady state over the year? What what do you usually take into um, consideration? Do you want to talk about? It? Yeah, you can go ahead, James. Um, well, I was going to say that uh, <coughs> typically there's a hydrotechnical assessment done on a, on a case by case basis to determine um, the flow rates. Um, this this river is quite quite flashy, so it's it's you know when you're out there. Uh, doing construction this summer, it's literally just a little trickle. So um, I think it's a developing um, field in the Coquihalla area. I know as part of this, a lot of research was done okay. uh, by various consultants to to land on, you know, what to do in the future. So I, I think this will actually change the uh, what's done going forward. Yeah, okay. and in, in addition to that, I think uh, how the span arrangement or we added up actually and add, add, adding up a couple of more spans at each of the locations, just in the case the river wants to go and wide, open up more so that it lets the discharge rather than being concentrated at only one location, you have a lower discharge actually on a wider area. So I think mm. that that's why we ended up putting more spans at all of these bridge locations. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then, so you mentioned a lot response and reinstatement and, and lots of the thoughts that went into it. And it was very much a very all hands on deck um, uh, type of work. Was was the scope of work, and perhaps you mentioned that and I missed it, to reinstate or also to strengthen for future events? Was it to bounce back or to bounce back better? Was that part of the considerations or not? Yeah, the motto for the job was actually like uh, build back better. Um, okay. So okay. yeah, the idea was to uh, yeah not only meet the uh, you know the current criteria, but to to build this uh, resiliently for climate change and and future okay. large flow events. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Okay, so we we have a question from um, Rajiv Kumar. Um, why were and I think that came up when James you were presenting. Why were MSC walls selected as a possible repair alternative and not sheet piles? Uh, maybe I, I can answer that, James. Or is okay. it for yeah. the te temporary works? Or I think if if the MSC walls is actually related to the temporary works, everything hinged on the availability of the material at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think bringing in the equipment to actually install the uh, the sheet piles, we would have to actually mobilize a rig that would have become a concern, and mm -hmm. then even getting the sheet piles in place at the at a short notice was also a big thing as well. So in terms of the construction of the MSC walls, it's a very easy construction. You know, like we just need a compactor, the gravel backfill, which was already there in the river. And as well as, you know, like getting those uh, geogrids and the baskets is way more easier than any other type of material. Got it. Can I just add that the, uh, the, the alluvium at places like Jessica were full of like boulders and cobbles and things like that. And uh, advancing sheep piles would have been very difficult. Yep. Okay. 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 Um, I don't think we had um, any any questions from um, the audience, um, and I was I, I didn't I didn't have any other questions. Um, so I don't know if Brad wants to say anything. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed this and, and learning from this uh, case history. Um, the next one uh, will be Joe Wortman uh, with uh, sneak preview number two on the also landslide. Uh, Brad, is there anything you want to um, add or um, we're right on the hour? So, Well, of course, as soon as course. we said that, another <laughs> question came in. And so we can uh, we can go ahead and take that one. And 
It was any shoe oh, used okay. for protecting damages in open-ended steel pipe piles and uh, dense glacial till? If so, was there any cutter head in the shoe? Uh, well, it's um, where the till, uh, piles were in the glacial till at Jessica there, we had the two different options. Uh, one was this ring bit system. So there's an actual uh, a bit that spins on the bottom of the casing and then uh, you know a lead connects to it. So that's a pretty robust uh, cutter head on the bottom and provided uh, quite a lot of uh, additional area when we were um, driving it into the glacial till after. Um, the conventional piles, uh, yeah, we, we put a shoe on it. It was more of a, um, we, we had to screw the pile in through the, uh, the dense gravels and stuff like that. So it was more uh, teeth welded on versus, uh, versus a driving shoe. Excellent. And that does appear to be the last question now. And Katarina mentioned the next live stream coming up, the next sneak preview. It will be Joe Wartman from the University of Washington talking about the 2014 Oso landslide. If you have not figured it out yet, all four of these sneak previews will be case histories from the Pacific Northwest, two American and two Canadian ones. It's like we planned it that way. James, Gurpreet, thank you for doing such a great job today. We really appreciate it. Fantastic presentation and way to get us kicked off with these sneak previews and get the people looking forward to coming to Vancouver in February. Katarina, thank you for moderating. And I, I thank you also for getting everybody fired up. I will do the last fire up because that that is usually what I do. I did not wear my Geo Congress 2024 jersey today and I feel I was remiss in doing that. I will make sure that next time I am wearing it. Again, if you liked what you saw today and hopefully you did because you're here at the end, click like, subscribe and get notifications and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. We'll let you know very lovingly in an email that does not go to everyone in the world. Again, check out our Eventbrite for all of our upcoming live streams. Geostrata Extra is coming up in just five days. And of course, that will be featuring an in-depth interview on an article from the October, November issue of the magazine. So you will want to check that out as well. We hope to see you then. We hope to see you at the next sneak preview. We, of course, hope to see you in Vancouver in February. Our producer today was Sean Herpelsheimer. Thanks, Sean, for doing a great job. Thanks again, Gurpreet and James and Katarina. And we will see everybody very soon. Thanks very much.